This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. We're going to look now at IFRS 15, dealing with the very important subject of revenue. Revenue or sales or turnover is a very political number and businesses periodically overstate it. So the rules setting down principles on rev when revenue should be recognised are therefore very important. And it comes back to very basic things. So, for example, if an airline collects some money from a customer um, and maybe the customer is due to fly three months later, when does the airline book the revenue? Do they book the revenue when actually <clears throat> they get the money or when the flight takes place? And the answer, of course, is at the time of performance when the flight takes place. Does it make any difference if the flight is non-cancellable, so the customers lost their money? And the answer basically is no. It makes no difference whatsoever um, in almost all cases. <clears throat> so you book the revenue at the time of performance. That's the big message. IFRS 15 introduced a five-stage model for revenue recognition, which you will have met when you studied financial reporting. So step one, determine whether there is a contract. Step two, decide what the obligations are under that contract. Step three, understand what the price is. Step four, if you know the obligations and you know the price, you can now allocate the obligations, the, the price to the obligations. And finally, as those obligations are satisfied, I can then book the revenue. So a nice logical approach. In many ways, though, I suppose it's what most reputable companies were doing before the standard was ever issued. So our notes go through those five steps with lots of examples. The first step is about identifying if there is a contract in the first place. Well, that goes back to your study of contract law in contract. So essentially, there's a contract, of course, if the two parties have agreed to enter into contract, but that does not normally need to be in writing, but they need to have approved the contract. And the key thing is that there's going to be a contract if you will probably get paid. You might say that you wouldn't enter a contract if you wouldn't probably get paid. I know, I wouldn't either. But if the question says they probably won't get paid, well, just, you know, lie down and take it and effectively say, well, if they probably won't get paid, this is not a contract. At the end of the day, it's like some kind of gift, if you like. So step one is identify the contract. Step two is then to identify the obligations under the contract. These are the things that could be separately sold. So I know that in a fast food restaurant, if you're buying burger, fries and drink, that there's a package price, isn't there, for the burger, fries and drink, which is less than the separate price of burger, fries and drink. You can actually buy the burger without the fries or the drink without anything else and so on. Those are our performance obligations. So there are things which are distinct and the key thing about them is look for things that could be sold alone. Then if they could be sold alone, then they need to be accounted for separately. Now, usually in scenarios, I don't think that's going to cause any real problem. But pause the tape for a minute and have a read of Livertech. So this business sells hardware. It supplies and installs software. And it provides a technical support package one of those helplines that you phone up or email and they come back with the answer to your problem. So they sell them separately. 
In addition, you can buy them. A very common word is as a bundle. I think that's what games shops tend to say. Buy this bundle of games. So you, there are effectively a series of separate performance obligations and therefore they should be accounted for separately. So it might be that you wish to distinguish, for example, the installation of the software, recognize that once it's been installed, the provision of services would be over the period of, te of, of um, the support service that you're given. A very common thing might be that you buy some equipment like a TV and you also buy a guarantee for three years from the uh, company that's selling it. There are separate performance obligations if they're separately sold. And so the income from each of them should be recognized separately. So stage two is decide what the obligations are. Stage three is sort out the price and essentially of course the price what you're really trying to do is to simply say what is it that I'm most likely to receive so what am I most likely to receive because it could be that the customer might get a volume rebate or something like that. So how likely is it that the rebate will be payable? Take that account. Lots of judgment, of course, but use your common sense to assess what you're most likely to be paid. Think about sometimes consideration might vary um, depending, again, on the volume of stuff that people are buying. So What's the most likely amount of goods that I'm planning to sell? Think about sometimes where there's a big financing component, in which case that might need to be stripped out of the transaction. In the UK, there's a major uh, chain of furniture shops. And one of their big selling points is they say they give customers four years interest free credit. Now, of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a marketing tool, it's fine. So there's no such thing as interest-free credit, is there? Unless it's from your mum or your dad or your brother or your sister. So yes, you'll be paying a different price because of this so-called interest-free credit. And the company that's booking the revenue needs to separate out that price. Pause the recording and have a read of example one, and then we can play with the numbers. So this company sells the car for 10,000. You don't need to pay for three years. I don't think I'd offer that. I'd be worried about them running away with a car. But anyway, normally interest rate is 5%. It needs discounting to present value. When we do that again, so we're going to have to do some discounting to present value. So we need to do that to measure the consideration really at much more of a fair value. So we'll see how that works over the three years of the contract. If you logically, if you went to that particular seller and said, I want to pay cash today. Would you pay the same price? I'm sure you wouldn't. You'd pay a lower price, um, essentially. So we're just saying separate out the streams of income. This is partly a car seller and partly almost a bank providing finance. So if we think about that transaction over the three years, so this is playing around with the numbers in example one. Time naught is going to be the date of sale when the customer collects the car. Time one is one year later. Time two, one year later. Time three, one year later. So we're doing more here than the requirement says, but just to think around this transaction. So in the balance sheet, there'll be a soft P 
So a receivable. Right until time three. In the profit and loss, the first thing is you will get the revenue from the sale of the car. Discount that in the first year. So I think this was $10,000. It is a three-year arrangement. Normal interest rates, 5%. So 10000 5%. Three years. So I would put revenue on the actual transfer of the car. If I round, I think that comes out as 8638 with a corresponding receivable. That's the date again when the car is delivered from the customer to the customer. So this is when the car is given to the customer. Now, over the next three years, that so-called discount will unwind. So we will therefore get finance income. So one year later, we can start to unwind the discount. 5% of 8638. Is 432. So the receivable goes up to 9070. The next year, of course, will continue compounding 5% of 9070. 454. The receivable goes up to 9524. And finally, in the third year, 5% of 9524. 476. The receivable is 10,000. So, it's, it's beautiful, I sometimes think. It's like art, isn't it? So we create a beautiful thing in the profit and loss as we show those two performance obligations. The two performance obligations are to supply a car and to give credit. I suspect that the giving of the credit, the finance income, would be shown further down the profit and loss as opposed to on the revenue line. Because I think my primary activity is I'm a car seller. Step one, identify the contract. Step two, identify the performance obligations. Step three, identify the price. Step four, if you've got a series of obligations and a single price, we now need to allocate the price to the obligations. And again, if given no other information, as it says here, use the standalone selling price of each of the products that we're offering. Pause the recording, please, and read example two. So because they've bought the bundle, they're going to get revenue of uh, 10,000. If the customer had bought these things separately, they would have got revenue of 11. So I need to allocate again, uh, the revenue I'm actually receiving to the two performance obligations based on the standalone selling prices. The standalone selling prices are highlighted in blue. The bundle price is highlighted in yellow. So I'll need to do a little bit of a working to sort that out. I can see this is over two years. Um, just to try and think about this for a moment, let's just think about the accounts. 
I'm focusing on the profit and loss account. I'm saying, look, what would happen in year one and what would happen in year two? Well, there are two streams of revenue. There's the sale of goods, which is the home entertainment system. And there's also the provision of services. So I'll need to do a working using the standalone prices. If you're good at maths, you may not need to do a big working, but it's probably easier um, to, in case you go wrong for the marker in your exam. So I'm looking at the standalone price and I'm looking at the bundle price. Can I call it a bundle? Well, I have the bundle price. First, there's the good and then the services. The standalone price of the goods is 9,000 and the services is 2,000. I'm looking there at the blue numbers. That's 11,000. The bundle price, let me highlight those in the same color, which was blue. The bundle price is 10,000 for this lucky customer. So I need to allocate and prorate based on the standalone prices. So essentially, I need to allocate that 10,000. And so what's going to happen is that 9 elevenths of the 10,000 will be for the goods and two elevenths of the 10,000 will be for the services. Nine elevenths for the goods, two elevenths for the services. So if I prorate that, I think that's 8182. and 1818. So on the date the customer gets the goods, I will book the 8182. The services are to be provided over two years. So it's a two year maintenance package. So I'll recognize half each year. So each year, I'll recognize 1818 over 2. 1818 would be 909 in the first year and 909 in the second year. Now, it's worth saying as well, perhaps, that's the position in the profit and loss. What is happening in the soft P? Well, in this case, my assumption is the customer is paying up front. So you will have some deferred income. Historically, this has been known as deferred income. It seems to me now that the politically correct word to use, though, is contract liability. So at the end of the first year, so if you're calling it deferred income, I'm not going to throw my toys out the pram. In the first year, you've received 10,000. 8182 and 909 have gone to profit and loss. The other 909 will sit in deferred income. As I say, this is normally again expressed now as contract liability. It is a credit balance, don't forget. 
So it's in the liability section. It's in the liability section of the soft P. Stage one, is there a contract? Stage two, performance obligations. Stage three, the price. Stage four, allocate the price to the performance obligations. And that will bring us in just a minute across to step five. When do we recognize the revenue? So there are two possibilities, essentially goods and services. Rather than say goods and services, now they say make a distinction between revenue that is recognized at a point in time and revenue that is recognized, this will be across the page, over time. So in other words, is it sometimes it's appropriate to recognize at one point in time, sometimes it's appropriate to recognize over a period of time. So let's just highlight that for point in time and over a period of time. If it's a point in time, it comes back to all the words you've learned ever since you were four years old. Transfer of risks and rewards, transfer of control, transfer of title, who takes insurance responsibility? Those are all of the considerations that you would have in mind. So essentially, again, if it's a single point in time, transfer of title, physical possession, a very important word is transfer of control, risks and rewards of ownership, Frequently in scenarios, we might be engaged to build something for a customer and the customer pays a deposit, but the customer doesn't really get access and control until the end of the contract. And that presumably would then be the time when you would normally consider recognizing the revenue. So that is a point in time. Now, let me just jump a little bit in terms of the notes if, on the other hand, it is over a period of time, then you have to think when assessing revenue, how complete the contract actually is. There are lots of different methods to do this. But principally, again, principally, you could look at the amount of revenue that you've earned or the amount of the cost that you've incurred. So if you look at the amount of revenue that you've earned, it's sometimes known as the output method. If you've looked at the amount of the costs incurred, it's sometimes used as the input method. But really, they're giving very posh names to very basic concepts. So if you're doing something for a customer where you think it's appropriate to recognize the revenue over a period of time, then a common sense one is to look at the revenue approach. So consider how much work has been done to date as a percentage of the total contract revenue. So this word work certified, again, this would be something that you would find out from something like a surveyor or independent arbitrator would say, this is the value of what you've done today. Or, as I said, you could look at the costs and compare them to the total costs. All sorts of possibilities there. Now, on this page, you will see, if you look above, example three and example four. Um, there are good answers to those in the back of the notes. I'm not going to go through them because they are so similar to the one that we did in the last example. So, you know, they work in exactly the same way where you are simply allocating the, the revenue against the performance obligation. So I'm not going to go through those, but I will say a very brief word in a moment about example five, 
which is some kind of building contract, some kind of building contract. And for some reason, they've decided it's appropriate to recognize the revenue over time. Just looking at some of the figures that we've got there, um, we're told that the contract value is 45. We're told that the costs incurred are 20. The cost to complete are 12. So how much revenue should I therefore recognize? Well, I could use that output method, the, 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 sorry, the input method, the costs, and say, to date, I could say the total costs are that I've incurred are 20. The costs to complete are 12. So I've incurred 20 to date. The total costs a 20 plus 12, that's 32. 20 over 32 times 45 would give me, I think, revenue if I round it of 28. So that would be the revenue that would have been booked to date just over a period of time. Five stage model then, identify the contract, its obligations and the price, allocate the price to the obligations and recognize the revenue as the performance obligation is satisfied. And what I might do just back here is just kind of write that in bold so what we need to ask about with revenue of recognition of revenue is essentially, I'm just going to write it back here, recognize revenue as, here's the keyword, the performance obligation is satisfied. So there's a review of the five-stage revenue model.